leadership team for serving us up so well. Maybe your mind was where mine was when they were leading us in worship. The words of the Apostle Paul who said, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith so that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That's the power I pray that we will experience every day that we're here. I may have told you this, but when I was at Masters, every day I was here was the best day of my life. Having the privilege of being able to be exposed to the word of God, refreshed in my heart and strengthened by people who are committed to my personal holiness. And that's what I pray this week and this semester and this year and this collegiate experience is for you. I would ask you this morning, if you would, to continue with me this week. Go to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. Meander back to the Old Testament and meet me in one of the most important chapters, I believe, of the entire Old Testament in the Word of God. A passage of Scripture that hits head on a topic of Purity. Purity. We are a people, by God's saving grace and mercy, who are radical about purity. And when I say radical, I'm not understating it because Jesus himself, you might remember in Matthew chapter 5, said if your hand causes you to, causes you to stumble, what? Cut it off and throw it from you. Or if your eye causes you to stumble, to gouge it out, it would be better for you to take a rusty bicycle spoke and aim for your eye and plunge it from you than for you to use that instrument to sin against the God that has saved us. There's, there's a strategy in the word of God, a plan that's unfolding here for us here in Proverbs 5 and other places that helps you and I make sin unrepeatable. Uh, the very sin that would have captivated us and held us, the sin that takes many down. In fact, many are the slain in the category of lust, and we have recent examples of that. But you don't have to look present day. You can go back all the way into the Old Testament to see the godliest man who ever lived, David, taken down by a giant greater than Goliath, his own lust. Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, taken down by lust, and then Samson, the strongest man ever to live, taken down by the same. There's a plan that we need because I'm not the godliest, I'm not the wisest, and I'm not the strongest, but I want to be among those who finish well and hear the Lord say, well done, free from compromise, free from scandal, free from the corruption that so undermines our testimony and neuters our usefulness. There's a plan that you need. Now, among all the things that I do, the highest and best thing that I do is get to shepherd my own church back home in Scottsdale, Arizona, Desert Bible Church. And the privilege of pastoring in that church is unequaled, that God would use me to stand in the pulpit to preach his word. But God's also given me a ministry at large and opportunity is to go in a variety of different places. I have a company that we use tools to measure hard wiring and that opens doors for me to function in the political space, to work with very highly visible political leaders. It opens up doors for me in the education space and the sports arenas. It opens up doors with law enforcement and military. And it is a unique privilege in my life to be able to serve one of our nation's combatant commands, the United States Strategic Command. That puts me in front of regularly the four-star general and all of his directors, three, two, and one-star generals, who oversee all of our nuclear uh, interests in the world. These are the people that are close to the button. They control the button. They're over intelligence. They're over cyber. They're over EMPs. Uh, they're over the bombs, the silos, the, the submarines, ballistic nuclear subs, the bombers, the F-18s, all of those things. That's what these guys oversee. Now, don't worry. I'm not that close to the button that you need to be uh, concerned, but I'm in the room. And one of the things that is a unique opportunity that's afforded to me is to work with the people who oversee our war games. Uh, the war games group is a fascinating group. And of course, when I walk in, uh, they say, well, you're not classified. So, you know, I could tell you, but I'd have to what? 
I'd have to kill you. I'm like, well, how about you just give me some general idea and rough me up a little bit and we'll call it good. And um, so I'm, I'm in the room with these people and our tools measure who the top performers would be. And there literally is on this team the best kind of leaders, the most amazing, brilliant people you could ever imagine. And these leaders have this capacity, and we can, we can identify it in eight minutes, but it's the capacity to think down the line through any direction all the way to the end, and then do that in every single possible direction, and then to work back from the finish all the way to the start to create strategies and pathways that create friction for our near-peer competitors, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and to create contingency scenarios that allow us to be perfect on our worst day. It's a chess game. And they have in their repertoire two main priorities, global lightning and global thunder. Global lightning is where after a year of strategizing, after a year of considering what are the possibilities of what might be, what are all the things that they could possibly do to us, and what are the gaps and vulnerabilities that they left open that we could exploit. And after we've gone through all of that, we simulate uh, through war games on comms and on computers exactly what we would do. And if that goes well, we all fly to Germany, put the world on notice, work with NATO, and then actually move subs and bombers into position and carry it all out. We do that every year. And I get to work with those leaders, which is crazy good. And you'll learn this about me if you haven't picked up on it already. Sometimes I tread where I should tremble. I'm in the room with these leaders, and I'm talking to the senior director of all of this, and I just said, can I, can I have permission to speak freely? Which is code for what? You might not like what's coming next. I said, I hear the plan, and, and I see that you have all of the capable leaders in the room to, to push it forward, to think it through, and to work backwards, but you're kind of grading your own homework. I said, when I was in ninth grade and I got to grade my own homework, I always got an A every time. I'm not saying you're doing that, but what I am saying is what Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until what? You get punched in the face. I said, nobody is punching your plan in the face. You think through all the implications of what might be, and you simulate, simulate without the actual pressure of fire put upon you. Because if you were in a nuclear contest, we would all know it. But by that time, when you figure out whether your plan was the right plan or not, it's too late. Well, what I want to do this morning from Proverbs chapter 5, you say, Pastor Justin, I got a plan. Well, I want to take Proverbs chapter 5, and I want to punch your plan in the face. Can I do that this morning? I want to punch your plan in the face, and I want to ask you, number one, do you have a plan? And number two, is it battle-tested where you know beyond a shadow of a doubt when that moment comes, you will stand? You will be firm. You will be held by Christ, but you will do insofar as is your responsibility. Take every measure that is available to you and acceptable to God to fight and win this battle. Proverbs chapter 5 gives us six warnings, and they're going to come at you fast. Six warnings that function as a plan and an incentive to never let yourself go down the road that so many people have said, I never thought it would happen to me. I've had the sad occasion in my ministry to sit across the table from many who've said two things to me. I never thought it could happen to me. And then when it did, I swore I would go to the grave with this secret. And God in his grace exposed the sin so that they didn't enter into eternity unprepared. Now you say, well, when it comes to this balanced and bold approach that we need, we, we need to have some kind of straight talk, and whether you're single or whether you're married, whether you're young or whether you're old, and by the way, lust has no age limit, that there is a straight talk that we need to have about obedience. And let me start here. You can have, as I'm going to show you today, patterns of righteousness and patterns of obedience where you can live your life consistently in victory. And I understand, having sat where you are, what the nature of the temptations are at the season of life that you're in, and maybe the temptations you're facing right now or even last night, the regrets that you came into masters with, for which the grace of Christ is sufficient both to cover and transform you. But the patterns of righteousness need to be defined in a way that we talk straight about sin because we often talk about the area of purity as, how's your purity? Well, we're struggling. 
Do you mean you're disobeying? Because that's really the language we need to use. Sometimes we use the language of I'm struggling to say, give me some space to continue to go down a road that I know is wrong and put myself in harm's way, but not too much in harm's way where I'm still safe. I'll do both. I'll straddle both. There was a guy in my church who came to me, dear, dear friend. He sat down, and uh, we were having breakfast, as we often do, and he gets in the, or I get in the car with him on our way to our favorite spot, and he says, I got something to tell you, and I said, what? And he began to describe for me uh, the kind of accountability that he had evaded to get to a place where he said, I, I have to confess a pattern of pornography and the sins that followed that, and, I, and I've, I've got to tell my wife I haven't told her yet, and I need to share this with you because I know that if I don't share it with you, I'll talk myself out of disclosing to my wife what, what happened, and I just, I really, really need your help. And, and as he began to speak, he began to say, you know, I'm struggling, and I'm struggling, and I'm struggling, and I said, well, um, I said, can I just stop you and ask you a question? He said, yeah, sure. I said, are you planning on killing me? Not the question he was expecting. He said, no, not planning on it. <laughs> I said, do you think you would ever kill me? He goes, no. I said, is that a very arrogant thing for you to say, Justin, I will never kill you? Don't you know that you are susceptible to any kind of sin? How is it that you can sit here so boldly and say, I will never kill you? He says, because I've decided in my heart that's not an option then why have you not decided in your heart that that's not an option? He goes, well, I, I guess I didn't really think that was possible because if you were to say, well, I'd never cheat on my wife, I would never struggle with that, then, then you're arrogant. I said, well, I understand if you think you stand, take heed, because you can fall, absolutely. We're capable of any and every kind of sin, and bigger, badder, godlier men have gone down than us. But Romans 6.11 says, consider yourselves, means think long and hard, as those who are dead to sin but alive to God in Christ. You have the power that raised Jesus from the dead to say no to that sin, and that sin has no dominion over you. You feel like you can't win. You feel like you can't overcome. What you need is a plan that cooperates with the grace of God. And this morning, I'm going to give to you what I gave to him. So Proverbs chapter 5, are you there? Are you there in God's word? If you're ready, say go. Okay, first principle, number one, here comes the first warning. You can't have it. Okay, when it comes to sexual sin, when it comes to immorality and impurity, you can't have it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can't have it. You cannot have it. Verse 1. My son, give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may observe discretion and your lips reserve knowledge for, verse 3, the lips of an adulteress drip honey. Now stop there. There's, there's something very, very active that Solomon is doing, particularly with his son. And he's telling his son to give attention to, which means to listen up, perk up, cup your ear, lean forward. What I have to say to you, you need to hear and you can't ignore. Don't blow this off because I'm going to tell you what God says. Now, Proverbs chapter 1 through 9, you need to understand, in ancient Israel, was what children were meant to master before puberty. So all the principles that are found in Proverbs chapter 1 through 9, the most dominant theme of which is purity, is what before you were ever confronted with the opportunity from without and the impulse from within, you were to understand that God speaks super loud, super clear, cup your ears, lean forward, God says no. He says no, not an option. You can't have it. And it's interesting here, you see in chapter 2, verse 16 to 22, all of chapter 5 that we're in, chapter 6, verse 24 through 35, all of chapter 7, principles for purity that young men and young women need to cultivate before junior high. So there's something that needs to be built into your battle plan that is rehearsed and practiced and tested before you get to junior high. I found my stepdad's porn stash at four years old. 
I found his video collection shorter after and saw things awaken inside of me that never should have at that age. And one of the principles that you see here in Scripture is get ahead of this, get in it early, and get in front of everybody else in your life that you love and care about and make sure that we're all on the battle plan, we're all clear about what God wants us to do so that they're not hearing it in the locker room. Incline your ear, verse 1, he says, to understanding. That word understanding literally means insight for the right course. God has in his word the right course, which is in contrast to the wrong course, as we're going to see. And discretion in verse 2, literally, Hebrew scholars have defined that word this way, a plan for avoiding evil and making the right decisions. So there's something where God says, listen carefully to the word of God and put it in your mind before the moment of temptation strikes how you will respond. Decide in advance, but understand more than anything else, you can't have it. Now, a couple of years ago, I decided that because Proverbs 1 through 9 was necessary for uh, all my kids, and I have five of them, but uniquely knowing how my son growing up would reach a point where he would be confronted with this, I decided to take him through Proverbs 1 through 9. We'd go to breakfast on Saturday mornings, we'd get donuts and chocolate milk, and before he could even write, he could draw different pictures of what the Proverbs were. And so we'd talk about the fool, and how he hates happiness, and how he lives as if there's no God, and the scar offer who just always rejects what's true and has to learn by consequences what he won't learn by wisdom and the sluggard with with in his bed a little sleep a little slumber well finally one day we got to the harlot and I was like I don't think I'm gonna have him draw that one (laughs) and he's like dad what's a harlot and I should have been more prepared I'm like how do you explain to a four-year-old what a harlot is and I'm like, it's a, um, I mean, it could, be, it could be female, but male, but in your case, it would be female. And, and um, okay, it's, um, it's a woman who wants to take off her clothes and say, let's sing with our bodies. He goes, that's weird. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's pretty weird. Are you done with your donut? Let's go. And so... <laughs> So we get up and we start walking to mom sent a list of things that she wanted us to pick up at the grocery store. So we're like, let's do that. But, but we walked in the checkout aisle. Now he's four years old. He's a little guy. And um, he's eye level with the magazines on the rack. And he sees the feature cover of People magazine, Kim Kardashian. <laughs> And he's like, Dad, is that a harlot? (laughs) Yes, son. That's a harlot. He looks, and I let him look for like two, three, and I'm like, let's go look at a picture of Grandma. Come on, let's go over here. (laughs) So I scoop him up and carry him away, and and, and, and my son has had to learn from very early on, there's something, son, you don't even want to get anywhere near. This will destroy you. And that has, that has served us well. Point being, the lesson from early on that we need to rally our hearts to at the very beginning is what? You can't what? You can't have it. Here's the second one. You don't want it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you don't want it. You don't want this. Verse 3, notice the contrast. He says in verse 2, your lips need to reserve knowledge. So in other words, the word of God needs to be in you through the ear gate and then out the mouth gate. And you need to always be talking about the scripture. The word of God needs to always be frontal in your, in your heart, in your mind, and on your lips. Because they're going to need to be louder than what comes out of the lips of the adulteress. Do you see it in verse 3? The lips of an adulteress drip Honey, it's appealing. You're going to want it. And if you have even the smallest taste, it will taste to you as the sweetest thing on the planet. And you won't want a little, you'll want infinitely more. There's, there's something here that's a warning where Solomon says to his son that you will hear things that sound great to your ears. 
You will hear smooth words that you can't find arguments against. You will find yourself going, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Why would we not do that? I won't go that far. At least I'm not doing fill in the blank. It's going to be fine. I can experience a, a, a taste of it. Takes you back to your days of Disney and Winnie the Pooh, right? I wasn't going to eat it. I was just going to taste it. No, you were going to eat it. And there's something about what she offers that is truly sweet. Like if sin wasn't pleasing, nobody would be doing it, right? If sin was like rice cakes, nobody would be eating it, right? There, there's a principle here that sin doesn't present itself as here's the thing that will shrivel your soul. Here's the thing that will wreck your testimony. Here's the thing that will destroy your marriage. Here's the thing that will neuter your effectiveness for the kingdom. This is the thing that will erase you from the earth. It doesn't offer itself that way. It comes with honey. And he goes on to say, smoother than oil is her speech. But look at verse 4. But in the end, she is as bitter as wormwood. So there is a, can I say it this way, a drop of pleasure for an ocean of pain. There's a reality that Satan does not present to you when you and I are tempted. He doesn't say, hey, I would love to separate you from God. I would like to shrivel your soul. I would like you to make a self-destructive path for yourself that you can't get off of so that you serve me till you die. Where do I sign up? That's not how it's presented. All the pleasures are put forward and all the pain is hidden. And it's making it look like it's just as good as the real thing, which is why when you compare Proverbs 5 or even chapter 7 and you look at the activity of the harlot, the adulteress, what you find is that those same words are shared between those who under God have the righteous romantic relationship that God designs, and this woman is offering a cheap counterfeit. There is a counterfeit that makes her speech smoother than oil, so that the presentation is vivid, it's polished, it's convincing, it's alluring, it's stimulating, and it's good. And it's good. I had the sad occasion to sit with a couple of my church. Last week I was in Kansas City doing some training, uh, and, and I got a phone call, a desperate, frantic phone call from a husband who uh, described the most unbelievable uh, illicit activity that was happening in his marriage that he had uncovered and when I finally got on the phone with her and said, what in the world has happened? She goes, I loved it. I loved it. It was the best thing I've ever had. It was the most enjoyable thing I've ever done. Do you hear the hardness of heart as I project to you what she said to me? It was amazing. And in the days that followed, what have I done? She wants to rip out her hair. Her and her husband haven't stopped throwing up every day since then. There's something that sin is not telling you, and what it's not telling you is what the scripture in verse 4 tells you. In the end, it's as bitter as wormwood. The word wormwood here describes a poison that produces unbearable suffering. Unbearable suffering. And you even see... It, she, she has with her words a tongue that's like a double-edged sword. It's a picture. It's a word picture. Your tongue, if you stick it out, has a line in the middle that matches what a sword looks like. He's trying to help you understand, son, when you see those words coming out of her mouth, what you need to think of is a devouring sword that is so sharp on every point of the blade, if you touch it anywhere, it will cut you. There's no safe point on this particular sword. It's double-edged. It will kill you. And you are in the most danger you have ever been in. And this is an unbelievable reality. Verse 5, her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of Sheol. Don't follow her. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable, and she does not know it. So she's not saved. She's staggering to the abyss, as unstable as she is, and she's going to where she'll take you if you follow death and the grave. You don't want that. You don't want that. So number one, you can't have it. And number two, you don't want it. Here's the third thing. You can't handle it. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor. 
You can't, what? Handle it. Okay. They're like, none of the other preachers do that. Um, Verse 7. Now then, my sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house. Here's the principle of safe distance. Here's a principle, biblically speaking, where twice Solomon front loads this, listen to me. And then he says, don't depart from the words of my mouth. The importance is so, so high. Don't blow me off. Whatever you do, don't get near sin. We know what happens when you get near sin, right? Doesn't it say in chapter 6, can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not get scorched, right? Uh, Can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? If you you play with fire, you're going to get singed. If you flirt with fire, you're in harm's way. And Solomon is exposing the subtlety of our fleshly rationale. Watch this. Keep your way far from her. Now, the, the legalist is going to pop up and go, well, how far is too far? 500 yards? 100 feet? 25 feet? How close can I get to sin without sinning? This is a favorite question I get in premarital counseling that I do as a pastor. Well, pastor, how, how far can we go? And that's a defective question. The question is not how far can we go, but how holy can we be? I often tell my kids the fable of the king who was trying to find a chariot driver for him. And he asked the top drivers in the land to gather. And he put them all in one spot. And he said, I want to ask you, gentlemen, how close could you get me to the edge at full gallop without causing the chariot to spill over and lose my life? I want to know who is the best driver And so the first guy pipes up, and he says, O king, I can run my horses, the stallions, at full speed, full gallop, and I could bring you within three feet of the edge and not go over. King said, that's impressive. Next guy pipes up and says, O king, I can beat that guy. I can bring you within six inches of the edge and keep you from going over and the king says that's that's amazing and the third guy says king if I'm pulling you the very last thing I would do is speed with you in my chariot that close to the edge I would stop the chariot make you get out move the chariot forward so that you're no longer in harm's way walk you to the place where you can get back on when it's safe and carry you forward who do you think got the job third guy it's not how close can I get it's how holy can I be that's the issue and and, and maybe say it this way and and if you want to write it down this is maybe a hateful uh, uh a helpful way to say it, you can't safely put yourself in harm's way. You can't safely put yourself in harm's way. It's foolish to underestimate sin's pull. It's foolish because of our vulnerability and sin's strength. And the point is that that if you're close enough to see her door, if you're close enough to hear her voice, you're too close. There's no legalistic rule, yardstick you have to pull out, run from sin. That's the Joseph principle, right? In fact, would you find this so interesting? Write this down somewhere. If you are fighting sexual sin, you're losing. If you are fighting sexual sin, you're losing. Nowhere in the Bible are you told to fight sexual sin. You know what you're told to do? Flee. Flee. The reason that David, Samson, and Solomon fell into sexual sin is they didn't have a good pair of running shoes. Or if they did, they didn't use them. Run is the Joseph principle. How far away can you get from that thing which you know is a sin against God and will create destruction to your soul? Charles Bridges has helpfully said to thrust ourselves into temptation is to throw ourselves out of God's protection. Can I read that again? Because I don't want us to miss that. To thrust ourselves into temptation is to throw ourselves out of God's protection. 
It's the will of God, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, that we abstain from sexual immorality. One of the reasons that couples often come to me and they're not really sure whether God wants them to be married, I ask them, are you pure? They say no, if they're willing to admit that. Well, how then could you hope to ever discover God's will for your lives that's not in Scripture when you're living in direct contradiction to his will, which is in Scripture? You'll never find that. Don't flatter yourself that you're strong enough. Realize that temptation is no kidding for real. There are absolutely no do-overs in this one. So, so what do we have so far? You see the warnings, here's the plan. You can't have it, number one, let's be clear. You don't want it, number two. Number three, you can't handle it. Here's number four, you can't afford it. Look at verse nine. You can't afford it. He says, if you go to the door of her house, and the implication is everybody knows where she lives. Everybody knows on what's that in, on that channel. Everybody knows what's on that website. If you go there and you get sucked in, verse 9, you will give your vigor to others. The word for vigor means stamina. It means health. It means honor in the book of Proverbs. And then he says, you will give your years to the cruel one. That is to say, uh, the one who will mock your misery is how you could translate that. You, you never want to be the person whose name is blasted all over social media, whose books are now being pulled from all the shelves, whose ministry and lifetime is being completely erased. You never, ever, ever want to be that person. You will find people mocking your misery. And in fact, the phrase, your years to the cruel one in Hebrew, uh, could be translated to describe how sin will shorten your life or you will spend the rest of your life cleaning up your mess. And then he says, look at verse 10, strangers will be filled with your strength. Your hard-earned goods will go to the house of an alien. If you write in your Bibles right next to this, you will lose everything. It was Stephen Farrar in his helpful books that said, sin will always take you further than you ever wanted to go, keep you longer than you ever planned to stay, and cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. You will lose everything. You need to be prepared, like our military is, to be perfect on your worst day. But if not, verse 11, look at this. You will groan at your final end. Now, students, look up here. The word groan in the Hebrew, it means to rot. To rot. I have seen men and women, and it's instructive. It's not lost on me. Those, every time I experience that is another reminder. No, 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 no. I've sat across from many who because of their sin have wrought. This is a promise from God's word. And sometimes we love the promises of God's word. They're like, God causes all things to work together for my good. And that's a phenomenal promise. And we should hold fast to that. But there are promises in God's word that are very negative. They function as threats to keep us away from sin. He, he says, your flesh and your body will be consumed. Remember when David said this? He said, when I was silent about my sin, my body wasted away as with the fever heat of summer. Day and night, God, your hand was heavy upon me. Well, he wrote about it later in Psalm 38 when he said this in verse 3, there is no soundness in my flesh because of God, your indignation. There's no health in my bones because of my sin. My iniquities have gone over my head as a heavy burden. They weigh too much for me. My wounds, they're not healing. They're going foul and festering because of my folly. And I bent over and greatly bowed down and go mourning all day long. My loins are filled with burning. There's no soundness in my flesh. I'm benumbed and badly crushed. I groan because of the agitation of my heart. You don't want that. If you could see the lives of the people, and from time to time God lets us look who've been devastated by sexual sin, you would say, nah, I don't need it. I, I, I don't need that. So, so you can't have it. You don't want it. You can't handle it. You can't afford it. And then this, number five, you don't need it. 
You don't need it. It's one thing to take a look at the consequences of sin, and I would urge you to do that. This is one thing you could do with your RAs at your wing study. This is something you could do with your roommate. This is something you could do with your boyfriend or girlfriend. This is something you do with your pastor, uh, whoever is in your life spiritually that would make the most difference. Create a long list of the consequences of sin. Think long and hard about the faces that you will have to look into to explain yourself when there is no explanation for the shame. The revulsion of the people who would, would revolt at the sight of you. The squandered opportunity for God to be glorified in your life. The confusion and the disorientation that happens to other believers who thought you were one thing only to realize you were something different. The relief of unbelievers who would relax in their sin because of what they justify now seeing in you. The reproach on the gospel that you shared with people who now feel no need to trust Christ because if you say it transformed you and you live this way, which is no better than them, then why should they trust Jesus? The mental anguish of grappling with total uncertainty, the potential physical repercussions of things like STDs, the ongoing battle you'll have with your thoughts, uh, the despair, the despondency, uh, the perversion of God's beautiful design. Oh, I, I, got, I got 26 here that I've been keeping with men in my church of reasons why we should never, ever go down because we can't afford it. But, but then transition to this, you don't even need it. You don't even need it. God has something better in Proverbs chapter 5. Look at verse 15. Proverbs 5, 15. You see it? He says this, drink water from your own cistern. You don't want to be the guy who says in verse 12, I hated instruction, my heart spurned reproof, I've not listened to the voice of my teachers, I was in ruin in the midst of the assembly. You want to, verse 15, drink from your own cistern. God has something infinitely better for you than immorality. It's his perfect design called marriage. He says, drink water from your own well. And then he asks a question that doesn't need an answer in verse 16. Should your springs be dispersed abroad? So your streams of water in the streets, would it, be, would it be so good to take something so valuable as water and walk outside and dump it into the gutter? No way. What God has given to you, which sin has perverted, is a precious, precious gift that he wants you to unwrap and then enjoy with all your heart in the right context. Something that is passionately, mutually gratifying, God-appointed romance as often as you can in, in the way that he has designed. A fire that's in a fireplace is a wonderful thing. A fire that is a foot outside the fireplace will burn your house down. There's something in your own provision from God that is so worth waiting for. And for you to say, I have... My heart so fixed on God's best for me that rather than taking this precious gift I have, my purity, and dumping it out, I will wait for the expression for which God intended me to appropriately enjoy it. Why waste it? Why would you sit down when you get engaged to the one that you'll marry and say, I have several things to tell you. Here's my body count. Here's things that I wish I didn't have to confess to you, but because in the interest of disclosure, I give you full permission right now to walk away if you need to, I have to tell you this. Rather than saying the joy and the satisfaction of a right relationship with God that flows over and spills into a sanctifying and well-pleasing righteous romantic relationship, you say, well, that's easy for you to say, Pastor, you're married. Yeah, I'm married. I met my wife at Masters. Get her done, right? Uh, 29 years ago, God gave me the most incredible woman, my wife. And she has satisfied me in the most wonderful, incredible ways. But would you notice what the text says? There is a physical side to this. Uh, verse, verse 18, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. So there is a context in which you can enjoy that with God's richest blessing. But then he says in verse 19, be exhilarated always with her, what? Doesn't say body, love. There's something deeper and better and purer and sweeter that God provides from those who understand the marital bliss Psalm 84, 11 says, no good thing does God withhold from those who walk uprightly. So what that means is that if God has not given it to you, either you're not walking uprightly and you'll misuse the gift, or it's not good for you. You say, no, I think it's good for me. No, he decides what's good for you. 
Several years ago, there was a conference that was held, um, I was reading about this recently, uh, by junk food manufacturers. They were all put together in the same context to ask the question, how can we give a more healthy product to our consumers? You want to hear something funny? Halfway through the conference, they gave up, and they started talking, how do we take people to the bliss point? Now, if you don't know what the bliss point is to appreciate this, the bliss point is that point in your body where you eat food that is so good and so rich and so satisfying that your brain sends signals to your stomach to stop. You've crossed the threshold of your bliss point. Well, junk food manufacturers got together and said, what if we identify what the bliss point is most commonly and find a way to take our product as close as we can to that bliss point before we actually go over? Because once we go over, people will go, I don't want any more. And so what they've done is they, they've so perfected the, the size, the crunch, the sponginess, the effect that will happen, you feel ratatouille happening in your mouth, right? All of these things happening. We want to take you to the edge of what satisfies and just come short so that you keep coming back over and over and over again. Students, listen to me. Satan knows your bliss point. And God knows your bliss point. And a hungry soul that's not satisfied in God will keep coming back again and again and again to what you will become enslaved to. The bliss point is in your right relationship with God. This is what Augustine said. When God converted him and had of his wretched immoral lifestyle, he wrote a prayer to God in his confessions, how sweet it was all at once. To be rid of those fruitless joys that I had once feared to lose. He said, you drove them from me. You who are the true sovereign joy. You drove them from me and you took their place. You who are sweeter than all pleasure. And that's ultimately, students, where we want to end this morning. Number, number six. We've been through a battle plan. You can't have it. You don't want it. You can't handle it. You can't afford it. You don't need it. But last one. You won't get away with it. You won't get away with it. Look at verse 21. For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his paths. His own iniquities will capture the wicked, and he will be held in the cords of his sin. He will die for a lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he will go astray. This is the horror of God's omniscience. Now, my time is gone, but let me, let me say as best I can this. We work so hard, do we not, to make sure that the sin that we have is not found out by people who are not God. People who are dirt clods held together by the breath of God matter more to us than God does oftentimes. I remember when we were here in college ministry at Grace, Rick Holland, who I know you know and love, told us a story that I've used many times in my own counseling, and it went like this. There's a couple sitting there hiding their sin, ultimately exposed, and Rick said, I just want you guys to know, somebody found out. And as they ran through the list of who could it be, the landlady, roommate, whatever, he said, no, guys, it was God. And they actually perked up and said, oh, just God. That's not a lust problem. That's a God problem. And let me, let me frame it to you this way. This may be the most important thing I say all day, potentially all week. If the sovereign holy, loving, gracious, majestic God isn't compelling enough to my conscience to live at a level of purity before his watchful eyes, there's nothing in the universe that will be. Now what I've said may sting. What I've said may have put its finger this morning on something that right now you're in the middle of or just came out of or you're thinking about going into. With all my heart and in Jesus' name, I want to say listen to the word of God, listen to me. It is not worth it. And if you find yourself saying, okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to not let anybody figure it out while I manage this thing quietly behind the dark with nobody knowing, nobody. And, and I don't want to tell anybody, I got this, and thank you, Pastor, that was a great message. And, and I'm going to go home, and, and, and I'm going to really, really, really pray about this, and, and we're going to change. It's going to be different this time. Jesus said men love the darkness rather than the light when they refuse to come into the light. The best and most wonderful thing you could do today 
is to run to the cross and then bring somebody with you where the knowledge of what's happening, where you are falling down, is now made known. Because let me, let me show you this. Please look up here. There's nothing that you will ever say to somebody that is so bad and awful that the cross has not already said about you. When you look at the cross, loved ones, and when I look at the cross, what the cross says is it took the murder of the Son of God to atone for that. The shame of our sin was screamed at the cross. But follow this. The same cross that screams our shame covers our shame. For you to be able to run to Jesus and say, your cross was enough, would you please forgive me? I need help, I am stuck. I need your grace more than ever to forgive me and to transform me, and I'm gonna bring somebody into my life who can walk me to the cross and who can hold me accountable, and I'm gonna share with them what's really going on, and I'm gonna bring it into the light so that the process of change and transformation can happen to me. The cross is our only hope, loved ones. And as we give our hearts again and afresh to the Lord, we say, God, with all my heart and with all my soul, would you turn my eyes to you and would you let me see that cross again which sets me free in the liberty in which I walk. Father, thank you for the time in your word this morning. Thank you for what is a very serious and sober text. Help us to step into the light, to not play games with the enemy or to nuke our souls but to let the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ be the means by which we are made whole again. Will you use this morning in our lives and use the season that you have these students at Masters to produce patterns of purity that last a lifetime with no regret? I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.